What's up you guys? Welcome to today's video. So obviously you can tell by the title we're going to be talking about what it looked like for me to fight a DHS case. I literally had to fight just to be Micah's mother. It was a very long process that spanned over the course of I want to say about a year and a half. It was emotional, it was very difficult, and you know, uh, nothing about it was easy. I do want to say that this is my own personal experience with DHS. And I have heard so many horror stories. I've heard so many other sides of it. You know, it really, it just comes down to what that judge says. The judge is like God in this, right? So the judge can say yes or no. The judge can stipulate you to different things. Every case is different. Every judge is different. Every person is different. Every family is different. Every situation is different. So, you know, this is just my personal testimony and my personal journey with DHS. And this was a very eye-opening, very emotional journey for me. And I just wanted to share that with you guys today. So before we get started, smash the subscribe button. We're almost to 90K. I can't wait to celebrate 100K. We have really built an amazing community here that I am so proud of. It's not just me. We're doing this together, so I love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting me on this journey. It means so much to me. And if I start talking about it too much, I will start crying. Y'all know me. So without further ado, let's get into today's video. So if you do not know why my child was placed into foster care, I will leave the I had a baby in prison on the card up here. You know, uh, let's just start with the first question that I get because this is this might be all over the place. I'm going to try to make it not all over the place, but it just that's how my brain works. So a lot of people ask me all the time, why didn't your parents step up and come get your kid? In my personal opinion, this was my own mess that I had to take responsibility for and clean up, so to speak. So first and foremost, let me just put it out there, it was not my parents' responsibility to come step up and take my child. This was my own, my own situation that I had to work myself. Throwing that out there. Now, um, I'm from New York, and I was serving time this time in Arkansas. That's 1,300 miles away. So my family, if they did want to come down and get my child, they would have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money and resources to come down to Arkansas, work it out with DHS, work it out with the judge and the court system to take my daughter out of state. And Arkansas and New York would have to communicate. It would be a very difficult process. They couldn't just come pick up the baby from the hospital. There would have to be a home study and a case study and background checks. It's not a it's not an easy process. So again, this is something that I just had to do on my own. So before I got out of prison, we'll start there. Before I got out of prison, I had a DHS worker come to see me in prison and they said, well, Jessica, you're seven months pregnant, eight months pregnant. We need to know your plan. Do you have family here? Where is this child going to go? And I had to just be honest. I don't know. I don't know. So it was kind of determined, you know, before Micah was born that foster care was going to be our only option. And when other women heard that, they were very quick to tell me all of the horror stories that they had seen. They were very quick to tell me how horrible and how evil and how, how bad the system is. And now keep in mind, I have never been a parent before. This was my first child. This is my first experience with, with having a baby. This is my first experience with foster care. I don't know. All I have is secondhand knowledge. I can't get on the phone, call around and ask people. I can't Google things. I mean, I'm, I'm in prison. All I have is these women telling me how horrible the system is. So if your child is taken, it's because you have messed up somehow. Is that the end of the world? Absolutely not. You can totally rebound, recover, and get your child back. I know plenty of people this has happened to. But when you're pregnant and emotional and going through that and you're hearing these horror stories, all you do is you worry. And it got to the point where I just had to be like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. Please stop telling me this stuff. Like, I can't hear it. I can't hear these stories. I can't hear about how you lost your kid and never saw your kid again. That's not going to happen to me. I can't allow that to happen. You know, and I had to focus on giving birth in prison. It was a very horrible experience, very traumatic experience for me. So in the weeks leading up to my birth, I did meet with a uh, DHS worker. She came to the prison and kind of talked to me a little bit about how it would go, but I was completely unprepared for not knowing anything. So my daughter was born. Two days later, I was physically removed from the hospital. Correctional officers came in, grabbed me, and threw, like, they, they had to subdue me because I was so, like, I didn't want to leave my baby. I was, like, mama bear. I was... It's just a reaction that I can't explain, kind of built into our DNA when we have a 
child were very protective of that child and it just came out and my instinct was don't leave your child so it was a very difficult thing for me to have to go through. I left Micah in the bassinet they grabbed me, threw me into a wheelchair, threw me into a van, and took me back to prison. I did not hear anything from DHS, foster care, a caseworker, the foster parents for months, you guys. And that was just so like draining for me. I'd see these women have visits with their child that they had in prison and they'd come back from visit and they'd be happy and I was just empty. I walked around with a chip on my shoulder. I was so mad. Um, I had... I had PTSD, probably. Postpartum depression also kicked in, and I just didn't know what to do. So Micah was about six months old when I saw her for the first time. Maybe five months old. You know, it is kind of foggy. I walked into a courtroom, and the, the family court judge basically said because you're in prison there's nothing we can do uh, when you get out call and we'll we'll work it out you have 15 minute visit with your daughter so I saw my daughter when she was two days old then I saw her when she was six months old I didn't see Mike again until she was over a year old so let's talk about the steps that I took once I walked out of prison I got out I almost immediately called DHS and I asked for my caseworker who I didn't even know by name. I had to give them my name, give them my child's name, let them know, you know, where the, my child is placed so they could find her and they set a hearing for me. Uh, they did also say that I could visit before court, which I thought was really cool. However, the challenge was this. I didn't have money. I didn't have a car. I didn't even know how to get from Springdale, Arkansas to Searcy, Arkansas. It's a drive. It's, you know, three and a half, four hour drive. So I had to work that out. I had to hustle up rides. And I remember the first time I got to hold her and just be in the free world. It was just such an amazing feeling. The foster parents were so great. But then the court proceedings started to happen. That judge said, you need a job, which I had just gotten a job, but it paid like $7.50 an hour. You need a job that can sustain a child. You need to be able to take care of your child. You need an apartment. The lease has to be in your name. Huge disadvantage for me because I'm a felon. And in the South, in a lot of states, they don't want to rent to felons. So huge disadvantage for me right off the bat. They said you need reliable transportation. Also, that would cost money. Huge issue for me. I didn't even have a driver's license. I made a list so I don't forget. They said you are going to have to com complete hair follicle testing, visitation every week, uh, NA meetings, parenting classes, psychological eval, and a child abuse test evaluation. The hair follicle test would happen every two or three months and they made me cry. And maybe that's because I was just really like overwhelmed with just life in general, but they would just cut my hair every few months and I'm like, oh, stop cutting my hair. I know they didn't take much, but like, it's like chunks. And when you continue to do that, it just got in my head. I'm like, I'm like, oh, you're cutting my hair. It was just a very, it's a very emotional process for me. I was also very, very tired. So for a couple of months, I had two jobs. And I remember walking into court very excited. You know, I passed my follicle test. I was doing the NA meetings that they wanted me to do. I had my, seat, my sheet signed. I had two jobs. I didn't have a place to live yet. And that was kind of an issue. You know, as I was at a halfway house. So I walked into court really excited because I got a second job and I'm, I'm saving a little bit of money and I'm doing it. Like I, I've crossed another thing off the list, right? The judge says to me, I'm not making enough progress and I need to get to work. By the next time I go to court, our next court hearing, if I didn't have my own house and my own car, I would not, we would not go any further. They would talk about petitioning to terminate my rights. I had about a month to get it done. I left that court hearing just scared. I remember just being so scared. Like, how am I gonna get this done? How am I gonna get this done? At that time, I was trying to find an apartment. That's a huge thing I have to cross off of this list. I would go to a place after place after place, fill out an application, pay $25 for them to deny me. Over and over and over and over again, I would get denied for an apartment. Now I have to get an apartment, right? You have to have a place to live. You can't live in this halfway house with your child. You have to get a place. I was running out of time. I was running out of money. I was running out of sanity. I mean, I was really just at my breaking point. And I found this duplex from just a sign on the street, you know, that said for rent. And the guy showed me the place 
and we're walking around and I'm like, okay, how much is rent? Okay, like I can do that. I'm gonna be real with you, dude. If you don't rent to me today, I'm gonna lose my child to the system. I've been filling out application after application. Everyone is denying me. If you don't rent to me, it's over. I understand that I have felonies on my record. I understand that on paper, I'm a shitty fucking person. But that's over. Not only will I, I'm not gonna party here, I'll pay the rent, just give me this chance, man. Please just give me the chance. I can't fill out this application, it's gonna come back, I'm a felon. He looked at me and he was like, dang, like, I just laid it all out there, you know what I mean? I was very real, very blunt, very in your face, like, I just had enough of trying to be nice and trying to get someone to trust me. I was just done. Rent to me right now or I'm losing my kid. And he said, you got security? You got the security deposit? And I'm like, yes, I do. And I, you know, I had saved up the money to do that. And he said, all right, all right, I'll give you a shot. I was so excited, you guys, that I literally didn't even notice. There was no refrigerator. <laughs> there was no refrigerator. Uh, and I remember like moving the small things that I had in. I had like a mattress on the floor, you know, because I did have people helping me out. Uh, I had a mattress on the floor and I had like a few clothes and like a dollar store like, uh, what is it? dollar store like little drawer thing where I would like keep my phone and like underwear or something. Like I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. And I walked in the kitchen of the suplex my first night there and I'm like, there's no fucking refrigerator. Like I just assumed that there would be one, right? And I just wasn't even thinking because I'm just like, you have to rent to me because I'm gonna lose my kid. I signed that lease though and I was so, like, I was so grateful. Cross that off my list. Court is in a couple of weeks. Now I have to get a car. That's a huge thing. That's a huge thing that I have to accomplish and I don't have the money to do so. I was very fortunate that someone looked out for me and this person loaned me the money that I needed for the car. And in turn, I would make payments and I would pay her back. And you know, I'm very grateful for that help, even though I'm not friends with that person anymore. Um, you know, our friendship kind of dissolved, you know, there was some drama. I'm still very grateful for that help. I will always be grateful for that. That's something that I can't deny. When someone helps you and they don't have to help you and they help you at a time where you don't have anyone, like you will always be grateful for that no matter what happens, you know? So I, I'm forever grateful to her and I, I've kind of kept that with me for a long time, you know? Does it, it, does it suck that we're not friends anymore? Absolutely. It's just part of life sometimes, you know? Not, not everyone is meant to be in your life forever. It is what it is. So two things, boom, I cross it off my list. I go back and I am like elated. I'm actually excited to go to court. Not only have I gotten an apartment and a car, big things I have to cross off my list, but I have not missed a visit. I have driven four hours to see my daughter for two hours for two months and I was working on two different schedules and I was just so proud of myself. I'm killing it, I'm sober, I'm going to all these visitations that are hella far away. I don't have fucking $10 in the bank, but my bills are paid and I did what you wanted me to do. I walk in that courtroom and I'm just like, this is my lease, this is that, this is this. I get up on the stand because the judge wants to hear my progress and she wants to talk to me. And the DHS worker gets up there and says, after all of this, you guys, after me getting the car, getting the apartment, you know, uh, doing all these things, going to meetings, that worker says to me, you're going to NA meetings? And I had given her the sheet of signatures, right? And I'm like, yes, I am. And she said, what step are you on then? You guys, I'm gonna be really honest with you. I did not know the steps. I couldn't tell you what step I was on if you had a gun to my head because I was so tired that yes, I was physically at these meetings, but I didn't hear much. And I wasn't you know, reading the book, but big book or studying the big book. I didn't know the steps and I just froze. And I thought, remember something, like remember something. I would fall asleep sometimes because I'm working two jobs and I'm just, I'm doing all this stuff and I'm so tired, right? I would work literally until my eyes were open until the end of the day and I would make myself so tired that I would pass out. So the job that I had was at a vapor store. That was from like nine o'clock in the morning to like four o'clock in the afternoon. At four o'clock in the afternoon, instead of going home and doing nothing, having that idle time, I would go to my telemarketing job from four to 10 p.m. You know, I was just working and working and working and working. So when that lady asked me, what, what step are you working on? Nothing. 
and I, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not working the steps. I'm going to the meetings. You wanted me to go to the meetings. And she was so crappy to me. She said, I want you to stay sober and work these steps. When you come in here, you have to know these steps. And I'm just like, oh God, like, okay, all right. And then she started rattling off all of the men that I had either been arrested with or I dated and you know, they pulled up my Facebooks and they're really just going over that. Like, who is this guy? Who is Randy? Who is this person? And I'm just like, mm. so it was very apparent to me that they did not want me to date somebody because if I'm going to date somebody, that means that child has to know this person. And the man that I choose to date would have to go through that stuff. So this was before I met Reese and I'm just like, I'm not dating anybody. Like I, I'm going to be a single mom forever, forever, forever. The DHS worker then decided to tell me, Working two jobs is not sustainable. It's not okay. You have to get one job that pays really well. And I'm just like, I am a felon. Like you want one, you want me to work one job that pays really well? Like, oh, I was so frustrated. So when I was living at the halfway house, I had heard this girl talk about this job called Landstar and she started getting paid really well to be a freight broker. I didn't know what that meant. And months had gone by, but one morning I just woke up and I thought, what about that Landstar job? I'm pretty sure this girl has a record, but she got a job there. This morning I went to my telemarketing job and I had said to my boss and my friend, I had two bosses, they were both my friends, I said, what do you think about that, that Landstar place? Do y'all know about Landstar? And one of my friends was like, you're never gonna get hired there. They don't hire, you're not gonna get that job. And I thought like, boy? Who are you talking to? What you mean I'm not gonna get that job? I'll go there right now in ripped up jeans and a Razorback shirt and he will hire me. Both of my friends laughed at me and said, yeah, right. So I drove my Scion XB, my little box car that I got for hella cheap. I drove my Scion XB to Landstar and I got that job on the spot and I was so excited. I drove back up to my telemarketing job to get back to work and I said, I got that fucking job. Doubt me again. Boom, like I was so excited, right? So happy. So uh, I was set to work there that following Wednesday, I went in on like a Thursday. So I still had almost a full week to work my two jobs and give notice and leave and everything. I was so excited my first day at like a real job. I had a desk and a computer and a phone and like it's a real job, like it's an office job. And it was just like, look what you've done. Like you're making real money. You're not making drug dealer money. You're making real money. You're working every day. Now you have your own office. Like this is so dope. I was so excited. And I think the only reason I was blessed along the way is because I decided from the jump, I just started, I decided from prison, no matter what temptation, no matter what obstacle is placed in my way, I will not sell drugs. I will not sell guns. I will not get it this way. I will do whatever it takes by any and all means necessary to not only do this right, but to get my daughter out of DHS. So I had been working at Landstar for a few months before Micah finally came home. My visitation was changed from two hours to four hour visits to six hour visits to overnight visits. The difficult thing here is when you're so tired and you're driving four hours to see your daughter for a little bit and then driving back, not only does it take up time, it takes up money and I was physically exhausted. So the quality time that Mike and I were getting was very, she wasn't getting the best pieces of me, you know? She was getting a very tired, very stressed out mom. Um, she was also getting a mother that didn't know how to be a mother. I had to learn my child. I had to learn what she liked, what she didn't like, what made her sad, what, what made her happy, you know, what she liked to eat. I had to learn a, a whole routine. So at the end, I was dating Reese and I dated Reese for an entire year before he moved in. That gave me time with my child. It's special, very important that we had that time together. But I'll never forget the day that I went to court for the last time. Micah had been staying with me for, I wanna say about a month. Uh, I was taking her to daycare. Micah was staying with me for about a month at this point. The DHS uh, office did give me daycare vouchers. That was the only assistance that I was eligible to receive in the state of Arkansas. If you have drug charges, you're not able to receive any kind of help with housing or food stamps or any of that. I wasn't allowed to receive that. I was, however, allowed to receive daycare vouchers, which I was so grateful for. Those did end after one year but I kind of had a little schedule with her in the month that I had her. 
we'd wake up, I'd take her to daycare, I'd go to work, I'd pick her up from daycare, I'd come home, I'd make spaghetti or like frozen pizza, I didn't know how to make anything or cook anything, give her a bath, she'd go to bed, I'd read her a million stories, and this was kind of a difficult transition for Micah as well, and I don't think a lot of people talk about this, but she was very like, I feel like she had like some sort of attachment disorder. So for example, I would walk out of the room, she'd immediately follow me, and it was almost as if she was very, very nervous to be left alone just for a second. I'd put her to bed at night and I'd make sure to stay there with her until she fell asleep. Now, I did have her in my bed a little bit here and there, but I wanted her to be independent and I wanted her to learn, you know, how to be secure and safe and I didn't want her to feel, you know, like she wasn't okay. But this was a difficult transition for her because the foster family had six kids. You know, she, she was always in a house filled with kids. Now it's just me and her. So it was very difficult for both of us. You know, I was, I was tired, I was stressed. Micah obviously picked up on that stress and she just didn't want to be alone. So, you know, the first few months was just really a learning experience for me and for her of learning each other and learning how I can make her feel safe and make her feel comfortable and secure. So I went to court after a month of her being home. We drove the 45 minutes to court. I was living in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and court was in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Everything was a drive, everything was a battle, everything was stressful, but I drove there and I just remember telling Micah, like, this is it, baby girl. This is it. After everything we've done, after everything I've done, this is it. And I didn't want to bring it up too much because she was little, you know, she was almost three. You can't tell an almost three-year-old like how significant this day is, but I'm like, this is it, baby girl, just you and me. But in my mind, I'm just like, you've worked so hard for this. This is the moment. Like, either they're gonna extend it and make you do more hair follicle testing, or they're going to give you your daughter forever. You know, and that's kind of something that you just have to kind of go with. You know, the judge could always change your mind and tell you to do something else. Uh, so we walk in court, I'm holding Micah's hand. We walk upstairs. My heart is pounding a million miles an hour. I don't know what to say. I, I'm just like, I'm overwhelmed with emotion. I'm very, very nervous. We wait for what feels like an eternity. They call my name and I walk in holding her hand, just smiling and I put her, I put her next to me and the judge asks me, how's it going? And I said, it's going really well. We have her little routine and she's, you know, she's an amazing little girl and it's just, it's going really well. I'm very, very happy. They're going over everything. They, they made sure I brought my pay stubs from my Landstar job. They had a copy of the lease. They had a copy of my car title. I had to give them all of this stuff. They got my psych, my psychological eval back, my child abuse uh, testing back to make sure I wasn't gonna hurt Micah in some way. They made sure they had everything out. They went over everything with me and it just felt like forever. I mean, they're just going over everything with a fine tooth comb and I'm just like, like what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? The judge looked at me and said, I'm very proud of you. And I'm very happy to tell you that this is the last court hearing that we will have. You now have full legal custody of Micah and this case is closed. Good luck to you. I, um, I almost couldn't believe that she said that to me. Like I had dreamed about this moment and this judge is finally telling me like, you're good enough to be your mom. Everything we threw at you, you did and then some. You overcame this obstacle and that obstacle and this, like, no matter what we told you to do, you adjusted, you got it done, and you won. That was the first big thing for me, leaving prison to accomplish. It was always there from the day I gave birth to Micah until she was over two years old, you know, almost three. This thing had just been there, right? Just kind of over my head, like, are you gonna do this? Do you have what it takes? Are you gonna are you gonna get your child out of DHS? After all the horror stories, after all of the tears, after the postpartum depression, after the trauma of labor in prison, after being homeless, not having a job, you know, I just crushed every single obstacle. And in that moment I realized <sighs> I did it. Not only did I I do this, I said I was gonna do it and I did it, but but really sky is the limit for what I can accomplish. And I was just so excited. Were there trials in me being a mom, me learning how to be a mom? Yes, I still struggle. I am not the perfect mom. I have my bad days too, I'm a human being. 
that little girl is going to grow up and know that I fought like hell. I fought like hell just for the chance to be her mother. It's something that no one can ever take away. It's something that I'm so proud of and it's a story that I will tell Micah. She knows that she has a very special story. She knows that that she was with me while I was in jail. I keep things very age appropriate, but I'm very honest with my daughter and she knows that she has a very special story. You know, Micah taught me a lot and she continues to teach me a lot about being a mother and about, you know, patience. That's a big one. But I'm, I'm overwhelmed when I tell this story because it's really a story about redemption. I've heard tons of stories that have gone the other way where a parent falls short and can't get their child and that is so heartbreaking and it's so difficult. I really want this story to bring hope to a parent that is struggling with this. We make mistakes, but we are human and you can absolutely recover and bounce back. I love you guys. Stay safe, stay sober, never lose hope. And I'll see you in my next one.